Yo, what's up everybody? It is Friday. Friday, Friday, December 9th. Yeah. So the market closed lower today. Folks, it was all over the headlines today. All over the headlines. Worst week since September. And I'm thinking, hmm, well, I wasn't really thinking, but I was wondering if you guys were thinking, hey, is there a reason for that? And I bet some of you know why. And the reason for that is, think back to September. That was a month that had a quarterly corporate tax drain. Remember? I mean, I, I talked about that in August. Here's um, a, a video I did, or here's, you know, a screenshot of the video I did back then when I said, you know, dark clouds are coming. And that's because now, folks, we're back to this pattern of quarterly tax drains and the big, the big one always is the April 15th tax drain. And so, you know, you got to respect these things. Now, the good news is these are all temporary. Okay, I've explained this in the past. You get these tax drains and um, you know they're negative for the market because financial balances of the non-government of the economy of us they're drained out and then it takes some time for regular the course of regular government spending to replenish those drains look I tell you this stuff like way in advance like I told you in August like September is gonna be rocky I told you I don't know when, like in October, I said that December, mid-December is going to be rocky. All right, who, who tells you this stuff? I mean, I'm giving you like exact dates. All right, we know the dates. I mean, it's not like I'm some kind of, you know, uh, have some kind of crystal ball with the dates, but we know what it is. It, it's December 15th, March 15th, uh, June 15th, and September 15th. Those are quarterly uh, corporate tax payments and then we have the big one on April 15th which is you know that's the big tax day now some of you might be saying well Mike I don't remember this really having this effect over the last couple of years and and you would be right to say that because over in 2020 and 2021 if you remember and I'm sure many of you remember we had massive COVID stimulus pumped into the economy and that stimulus that additional government spending kind of offset or muted the negative effect of these tax trains the tax trains were still there I mean I can literally show you um, I can show you uh, data by the way just let me say that my uh, this week's issue which came out on Monday of MMT Trader, my, my you know, principal report, the headline says, hey, look, you know, we're gonna have a mid-month pullback. Here it is, here it is. So, like, I give you the exact dates. And now, of course, the attention is gonna be, hey, you know, this is the Fed. For example, today we got producer prices and the the, uh, uh, the number was higher than the forecast. It was up three tenths of a percent. They were looking for a two tenths of a percent increase. So right away, you know, the narrative became, oh no, you know, inflation is higher than, than what we expected and then the Fed's going to be, you know, remain hawkish on rates. Look, I've been telling you now that we have, we have long passed the inflection point where rate hikes are negative to a degree that that they are you know drawing away from the positive fiscal effect of those rate hikes I mean we're we're on the positive side of uh, the rate uh, reality okay in other words like the interest income being pumped into the economy right now is far more impactful in a positive way than each successive rate hike that the Fed, like next week they're looking at a 50 basis point rate hike. I don't know, maybe they, 
Maybe they'll shock the market with another 75. I, I don't think so, but whatever. It doesn't matter. Right now, the positive effect of the interest income transfers into the economy from the rate hike. Look, I told you this, like, you know, uh, look, we're up 51 billion over last year, just in the first two months of this fiscal year. And by the way, in this first week of December, we're up another 6 billion. And that's just interest, uh, that's just the discount on T-bills. That's not even, we're not even talking, I, I say this like every video now, like we're not even, we're not even beginning to feel the impact from interest on treasuries, which is going to persist over a long period of time. So like, I give you this stuff in advance, like nobody, nobody does this, you know, I mean, I give you exact dates. Now here's the thing, we know, I mean, as long as you understand what's happening, I always say like, like knowledge, understanding, I mean, it, it's so important because then you see things with the proper perspective. You don't get freaked out like all these people. You don't do headline trading, getting whipsawed back and forth, doing what every one of these, you know, zombies are doing. They get a headline, they sell. Let me mention one thing about today's uh, PPI report. Like, it's another thing that, you know, I don't find unusual. Every commodity market, well, pretty much every commodity market, I would say like non-perishable commodities like metals and oil and stuff like that. All of those commodities, if you look at the, the curve, the term structure, like futures prices, like what is, what is the curve? All of those commodities will, will show you very clearly that rising interest rates equates to a higher curve, a positively sloped curve. What does that mean? It means like futures prices are going to be higher than nearby prices. Why is that? Very easy to understand because they reflect the higher cost of interest, the higher cost of storage, etc. The higher cost of financing inventory, etc. I mean, it seems to me like the only people who don't understand that are the people on the FOMC, the Fed themselves, because, you know, like, they keep raising interest rates, and that's one of the reasons why we didn't see, you know, a big decline in the PPI and the producer price index, because rate hikes are just, um, you know, they're factoring in, or they're raising the, the uh, you know, the price level going out over time. So every time they raise the interest rate, you know, that's why inflation is unfortunately probably not going to fall that much. I mean, we're getting a nice um, effect from the decline in oil prices, but I, I'm skeptical about how far that could go down. Actually, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen producers, oil producers, buying oil futures on this dip. Now, the price has come down. There's been a lot of, uh, you know, talk about the uh, $60 price cap that the G7, the, the G7 has put on. Uh, so we'll see if that's going to be effective. I mean, a lot of people are saying, a lot of analysts, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not one to necessarily chime in on this, but they're saying it's going to be a complete failure. We'll see. But we're getting some, some help from the decline in oil prices. But other than that, I mean, the, the rate hikes are sustaining a higher level of inflation than what otherwise would have been the case if rates were at zero. And I keep coming back to the, the Japan situation, where I keep pointing out that despite the fact that, you know, Japan is uh, running trade deficits, it's running uh, fiscal deficits, and it is a 100% dependent importer of energy. They got like practically no inflation. Inflation has been very, very modest in Japan because the Bank of Japan has been one of the only central banks not to climb on board of this crazy rate hike policy, this, ortho this supposed orthodoxy 
of mainstream economics to try to squash inflation. And, and you know, that's, that's a great example. Just like I've also pointed out, like Argentina is a great example where they keep raising rates and raising rates and raising rates. And every time they raise rates, the inflation rate goes higher and higher and higher. This is not what is built into mainstream economics. What's built into mainstream economics is a wrong understanding and they operate from that playbook. Anyway, again, um, I'm the only one who tells you this stuff. By the way, Elon Musk today, he tweeted that if the Fed raises rates one more time, you know, it's going to make the recession next year that much worse. Now, now for him, the, he, the way he stated it, it's a fait accompli. In other words, it, it, it's not like a question of whether or not it's going to happen. For him, it's a question of how bad it's going to be. And again, I did a video yesterday, David versus Goliath, where BlackRock was saying the same thing. And it's little old me saying, we're not going to have a recession in 2023. I'm telling you this unequivocally right now. I'm not backing down from my stance. We're going to have major, major fiscal expansion in 2023. I mean, you might have the Fed now really scratching their head next year about the inflation situation because it might not be coming down that much. And the more they increase now, the more the, the, the fiscal pump into that swimming pool via, you know, the interest rate transfer, the interest income transfers. They don't get it. They don't get it. But I think Elon Musk should stick to running Twitter, maybe running his Tesla company, maybe, you know, doing his, his SpaceX, and stop being an economic forecaster. You know, there's a story that I've told in the past that many of you maybe remember, but I'll repeat it. Back in 2003, uh, I was sitting on a, pa a panel at Fox News with then the former CEO of uh, General Electric, Jack Welch. And Jack Welch back then, he's passed away recently, but Jack Welch ba uh, back then was considered the greatest CEO of all time. Like GE in its heyday in the 90s was, was the hottest stock in the stock market. And, and you know, we found out later uh, everything that Jack Welch did to uh, pump up the stock of GE was very, very detrimental to the long-term health of GE. Like he basically transformed it into a hedge fund, like a financial hedge fund. Terrible, terrible. Anyway, that's a whole separate story. But I was on a panel, Neil Cavuto was the host, and I was there with Jack Welch, and I forget who else. And, ja and it was too early 2003, I don't know, maybe January, February 2003, maybe a little bit later than that, but at that time, uh, George W. Bush, who was the president at the time, we, we were coming out of a recession, they passed, Congress passed a fiscal stimulus, sending out $300 checks to everybody. Back then, that was a big deal, all right? We, we got used to much bigger checks now, like $1,400, whatever. But back then, that was something. $300 per individual, $600 for, per family. And Jack Welch was super bearish on the economy. Now, here was, you know, the, the, the god of CEOs. I was sitting next to him, Mike Norman. Nobody knew who I was. I, I was nobody. I'm still nobody. And Neil Cavuto, you know, he asked Jack Welch because Jack Welch used to be his boss when Neil Cavuto worked at CNBC. Like, Jack, what do you think? It's terrible. It's horrible. We're going to have the deepest recession. Worst recession in our lifetime. Basically like a Jim Rogers thing. Okay, and he went on and on about how bad it is. And he was, a, you know, the, the, the most praised and, and revered CEO, ex-CEO at that time, he was already out of GE, uh, of all time, Jack Welch. So he went on and then, you know, Neil turned to me and said, Mike, what do you think? No, I think we're going to come out of this. We got a fiscal state. He cut me off. You know, I didn't even get like five seconds <laughs> probably to, to state my case. And what do you think happened? 
The economy turned around in 2003. We went into a major, major boom that lasted all the way until like 2007 with the financial crisis. And, and that financial crisis, by the way, was precipitated by um, the government cutting down its deficit to, a, to practically a surplus. All right. But that's a whole other story, too. But anyway, there's a lot of talk right now. Just to, to connect the dots, I see a lot of articles right now about how CEOs are like the most bearish they have been in a long, long time. And I look at that and it immediately makes me think of my, you know, appearance on that Fox show with uh, Jack Welch. And I'm thinking, like, don't listen to CEOs. It's not, that they're, it's not that they're not smart, and it's not that they're not good at running their businesses, although that, that also might be up for discussion. But, I mean, they're looking at their book, and their book is right now. Okay, maybe there's orders in the future, but those orders in the future also reflect their customer's view kind of right now. And so... That can change, and it does change. And they don't look at these things that I look at. Like, nobody looks at these fiscal flow. I told you so many times, guys, folks, this is the first derivative of economic activity. Everything else flows off of this. And it's fine if you don't want to believe me and you want to believe, like I said uh, the other day, if you want to look at a chart, if you want to look at monetary policy, if you want to look at, I, I, I don't know, uh, uh, tea leaves or the phases of the moon, that's up to you. I'm sticking with this. I tell you exact dates about when things are going to fluctuate. Nobody else does that. And not only do I tell you that, I mean they happen. So I said, December 15th, quarterly corporate tax drain market is going to be. Now, the media is not going to tell you that. They're going to say like, Oh, the PPI number was high. It was a tenth higher than what they thought, okay? We can live with that. There's been many times in the past, even uh, pre-pandemic, when we had a PPI of 0.3%. Uh, I mean, it's not the end of the world, okay? So, like, they're going to they're gonna, uh, come up with a headline that rationalizes their view. And all, everybody's view, with the exception of what I talk about here, is going to be based on monetary policy because that's, you know, I mean, that's the thing. That's the thing. That's the only thing people consider. So that's it. So here's the thing. We get the dip and it could last. I mean, it could last through, you know, much of December, maybe even into much of January. I just looked the other day and it looked like, uh, you know, we really started to come out of last year's, um, dip like like late in January but that's because January we ran a surplus and that surplus the government surplus was due to they, they sold leases on the uh, uh, what do they call that the the the, the spectrum you know like uh, when they sell off rights to you know broadcast or whatever that is I don't know I was taught actually I was talking about that Last year, if you go back and look at my videos from last January, I was saying, we're running a surplus. It's no good. It's no good. It's bearish. But we're not, I don't think we're going to have that this year. So, uh, And by the way, just on a side note, the daily fiscal flows right now, they're really, really good. I mean, they're going in an uptrend, a very, very visible uptrend. And that's, that's strength, folks. That's strength. So like, you know, the dip, it's, it's a present, it's a Christmas present. I'm going to say it again, load up in December and then go away and play golf or go on vacation for the whole 2023 and you'll make a lot, a lot of money. All right? No recession in the cards. Have a great weekend. Bye.